morning. Thank you guys for that. Certainly not deserved, but I appreciate it. Quick shout out to three of my guys that a couple have been coming regularly now, so I hope this is a good thing. Three of the guys from Kiski Area High School, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and Bible Club are here. So thank you guys for being in the second row and encourage me. I appreciate you guys coming out, as well as all of you, the rest of you um, who I get to see. And it's just so awesome to see wrestlers and other people that I get to work with during the week. So thank you guys for coming. Pretty excited about um, the message today, and you'll hear a little bit more about a personal story that I'll tell you towards the end um, and why it means a lot to me. So this is week two. Week one was Andrew. Andrew last week talked to you about um, being patient, um, that we're all a work in progress as young people and as old people. We're all a work in progress. We're constantly refining, redefining where we're going to go, what we're going to do. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you keep central focus in your life. So today we're going to talk about know your purpose. Your purpose is to know Jesus. So it's a heavy concept. It's your purpose. Why am I here? But it's also a very clear answer to that purpose, and that's to know Christ and to teach others about Christ. But when you think about your purpose, one of the first things that usually comes to your mind is, what am I going to be when I grow up? I'm almost 60, and I still ask myself, what am I going to be when I grow up? So it's a natural question. What am I going to be someday? What's my purpose? But since these are really tough questions, and I want you to think about it a little bit, we're going to start out with something really light, really um, simple and fun. We're going to talk about some things, and we're going to try to identify the purpose of these things, just to, to keep it light as we roll in this heavy subject. So if you know what it is, the purpose of the object is, just go ahead and shout it out for me. So let's, let's take a look at these. Mood ring, right? So this, I think these came out when I was a teenager, maybe a little bit before that. The color of the ring would change supposedly based on your mood. I think it was based on your body temperature. Sometimes it would be red, blue, and green. And it was supposed to tell you what kind of mood you're in. And people would actually spend money on that. And that's kind of crazy, right? Don't you know what kind of mood you're in? Do you need a ring to shall you? So let's look at the current version. This is kind of a new tech mood ring. You plug your USB cable right into that. The computer comes back and tells you what your mood is. And it probably gives you some advice on what to do with that mood. What's the next one? What's this? Pet rock. The first group didn't know what that was. That is a pet rock. And I, I'm ashamed to say that I actually bought one of those when I was a kid in high school. It's got its cute little box with holes in it because you know rocks need to breathe. And it's got a little watering dish and some instructions on how to take care of a pet rock. Next, what's this? It's soap, it's stainless steel soap. And don't ask me why stainless steel is required. The purpose of stainless steel soap is to get the stink off your fingers. You're cutting onions or garlic or working with fish. Stainless steel soap supposedly takes care of that. Next, what are these? Bird steaks. You're supposedly put these around your deck or on your roof if you want to get rid of pigeons, woodpeckers, crows. I don't think they work, but that's what they say the purpose is. And the last one's kind of fun. What's this? You guys eat way too many tacos. The first group got it too. It's a taco holder. Take a look at that. I can't believe you guys got that. So that's a taco holder. You could probably use it for some other things as well. All right. So that helps us look at some things as we roll into the little deeper concept from a human perspective. What is our purpose? Do we know what our purpose is? Is your purpose just waking up each day, kind of going through your to-do list, being nice to the people around you and going to sleep? Good. I don't think so. I think it's far deeper than that. And that's what we're going to talk about. So when you first start to analyze what your purpose is, what's your purpose when you face difficulties in your life? What's your purpose if your parents are splitting up and it looks like your family's starting to crumble? What's your purpose if your family's hurting for money? Maybe there's been a financial crisis. Maybe one of your parents has lost a job and can't find a new one just yet and you're starting to make big decisions as a family, what am I going to do next? You can't seem to get out of a certain problem you're going through. You're really struggling with your grades. You're being bullied at school. People are bothering you. You start to ask more questions about your purpose. What's the bigger purpose in my life? What's the point of my life? 
you might start to ask God, and that's really where we need to go with this. What would God say my purpose is? Why hasn't God made it more clear what my purpose is? And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. I think he's made it very clear, the answer to these big questions. Sometimes we can get really confused about it, however, like those objects, and we can think that our purpose is what we're doing at the time. Our purpose is our career, or our purpose is our position on the football team, or our purpose is whatever else is the big thing going on in our life at the time. A little later, I'm going to share with you a story about a young man who means an awful lot to me and how he seemed like he had it all together and was struggling with purpose. And we're going to talk about that. So it certainly goes beyond your interests, your career, what you're going to be when you grow up. Let's take a look at what the Bible says about it. And we're going to look at the Old Testament first. Isaiah. A lot of people would argue that Isaiah was the most important prophet. Um, He had a pretty unique experience in his life. Isaiah actually got to meet God face to face. Um, His role was to share the words of um, previous prophets and words of hope and words of warning with the Israelites. Isaiah, I'm told, didn't really enjoy that much of what he did as much as he did the low-key life of documenting things for the palace. He was the palace scribe. But God asked him to do a little bit more. Let's take a look at Isaiah's commission. A little bit long, but I'm going to read it to you here. In the year that a king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on the throne, and a train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim. Take a pause there. I actually have to look up seraphim because in my mind, I had a vision what these things were. Small, maybe bird, um, butterfly creations. And it's not. These were angels. These were beautiful, tall, illustrious, sparkling angels. Each had six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. Two, they covered their feet. And two, they used to fly. And they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, this is Isaiah talking now. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in its hand, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? I said, Here I am. Send me. So Isaiah wasn't really sure what the purpose was, but it was obvious after seeing the glorious Lord and him being announced by the seraphim that he was going to be the person to go forward as the prophet to fulfill the purpose that God had for him. Actually, Isaiah got to see God in all of his glory. In his presence, Isaiah Isaiah thought about a few things. He recognized, first of all, how incredible God was. Up until this point, it had been his imagination. He gets to see him. He recognized how imperfect he was and how we, in general, are in comparison to God. He was a sinner, but through God and through the seraphim and the colds on his lips, he was forgiven. And finally, Isaiah was given a mission. We call it Isaiah's commission, but a commission is a mission. It's a goal. It's a task, an assignment. And in this case, we sometimes call it ascending. God asked him, who shall I send? He said, send me. So his commission was to be sent forward. Let's read a little bit more about his commission and what God explained the purpose was. Here's my servant who I'm uphold, my chosen one whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout out or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth, and his teaching the islands will be put to their hope. 
And it goes on to say in Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and of similar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet he considered him punished, we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We are like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the inequity of all of us. So when we read the words, we might be a little bit confused, or we might wonder what they're talking about. But these words clearly pointed to the coming Savior, to Jesus Christ. And Isaiah became very clear on his pro prophecy, which was to know Jesus and to tell others about him. So let's go forward now to the New Testament. And we talked about this at our Fields of Faith last October up at Kiskey High School. We talked about the Great Commission. So let's read Matthew 28 together. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus has told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So there's another sending, right? Although in this case, it's not Isaiah, it's the disciples. And the disciples are sent to send others to disciple others, to share Jesus. So what are all of us who are believers in Christ? We're those disciples. That's what our purpose is. All right, so this is the tougher part. I'm gonna share with you a very real and personal story about a young man who I helped become a Marine officer when I was a recruiter back in the early 1990s at the University of Virginia. His name was Alex. Here's a picture when I first met Alex when he was a Lance Corporal fresh out of boot camp. Tall, handsome young man, had the world ahead of him, all kinds of great things. He was just a super individual who I quickly fell in love with as his recruiter on campus. He had Jesus-like attributes. He was only about five or six years younger than me, but I looked up to Alex. Um, Girls on campus were very interested in dating Alex. He was popular everywhere he went. He was in all the clubs. But Alex wanted to talk to people about Christ. That's what was on his mind. Alex wanted to save himself from marriage. Purity was important to him. And he wasn't ashamed to tell his classmates and fellow Marine officer candidates those things. He graduated from the top of his class at Marine Corps Boot Camp, Paris Island. That's an incredible feat to graduate top of your class. After I got to know him, after he came to the University of Virginia and I got him set up to Officer Candidate School, daggone he went and did the same thing at Officer Candidate School. Graduated the top of his class. Became a Marine officer, a second lieutenant, and then wouldn't you know it, he wanted to become a pilot in the Marine Corps, but not just any pilot. Take a look. All right, that's kind of cool. I love Bon Jovi, so I, I really dig on the music in the back. But the reason I share about this with you is because you would think that a young man who was a Marine pilot who was going to be an F-18 fighter attack aircraft, the premier platform of the United States Marine Corps, um, would have it all together and that that would be his purpose in life. I'm going to be a fighter pilot. This is what I'm what I've been growing for, what I've been studying for that he wouldn't have any questions about his purpose. But I'm gonna share with you some pages from Alex's journal when he too was struggling with identifying his purpose. So I'm gonna read along with you. I'm only gonna read some of the highlights that I thought were most important from Alex's journal. My name is Alex, I'm 26. I'm an officer in the United States Marine Corps. I'm prepared to kill for God and country, whatever that means. Recent events in my life have forced me into the realm of self-analysis or soul-searching, if you will. For the past three months, 
The fragile structure, the paper mache wireframe construct I call my life has been slipping away like so much sand through my fingers. I don't like what I see. I call myself a Christian, one who professes Jesus as Lord and Savior. I am angry with myself. I know what I admire in men, and I lack those qualities. My accomplishments are empty. I've never felt more attached to God than at boot camp and officer candidate school, senior summer. Total exhaustion, mental and physical, equated to total dependence on God. I don't know. Boot camp and officer candidate school seemed real enough. Crying out for strength, at my wit's end, exhausted. Yet afterwards I ask, was that God or me or both? I think God, but I question. The men in the Bible, their faith was real. Paul, this is a man who knew his maker and knew him well. A faith so real, so all-encompassing that he knew that to die is gain. This is the faith I want. This is the reality I seek to experience God as he would have us experience him. I have to know, not just hope, that God is working in the world and I am working for him. So this is what I commit to. 15 minutes each day to spend with my God. First thing in the morning, I have no plan of study, no structured reading, no prayer format. I want God to know me and I wanna know him. That is my purpose. That is my goal. I found those words to be incredibly profound when you think again that here's a young man who had it all going had it all together, was going to be an F-18 pilot, actually was an F-18 pilot after this point. I believe it was later in the same year he added another page to his journal. And you'll see when you reflect on his goals that he understood Isaiah's commission, the Great Commission, and today's lesson, which is to know Jesus and to help others know Jesus. So I think this was in late 1997, maybe early 1998, I think he had started to sort out some of those questions he was having. And again, no, nothing about being a Marine Corps fighter pilot in these life goals. Daily what matters, relationship with God, relationship with others, with people. To have a genuine relationship with God, to be continuously aware of Christ and who I am in him all day. That I can live an extraordinary life, an uncommon life, and die without regret. To find my place in God's plan, light and salt. So I'm going to talk a little bit about light and salt as we close here. But you can tell I'm getting a little emotional. So this was probably just a few months before Alex died. He was on leave from the Marine Corps doing what he liked to do, exciting, exhilarating events. He was climbing the side of a mountain, lost his grip, and fell to his death. So a young 27-year-old Marine pilot, son, future leader in our country, snuffed away too early. But I honestly believe when I look at his goals, when he talks about living an extraordinary life, that he did die without regret. He was doing what he wanted to do. If he came back and got to see it again, I think he would do the same thing. Because that's where he wanted to be that day, climbing from rocks, unafraid, and was ready to meet his maker that he described earlier in his journal. So in addition to the two life goals, he ended that with light and salt. And I don't know for sure, but I'm 99.9% .9 sure that that comes out of this Bible verse from Matthew. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. 
Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your deeds and glorify your father in heaven. Alex was a light. And even though he's not walking on the earth right now, his light continues to shine on people. I share this story a lot with my FCA huddles and other people that I've known. And just a week or so ago, I reached out to his sister who had shared this journal with me um, shortly after Alex's death. And I told her I was going to be talking about Alex. Was it okay? And she was completely supportive of it. And um, we talked about it briefly. And she's so excited that Alex's life continues to show light in the world, even though he's not here. So I leave you with those two goals from Alex's journal as our part two in the series, not yet. Know Jesus and share Jesus. Doesn't get much simpler than that. It's hard, but it doesn't get much simpler than that. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for bringing Alex into my life, even for the short time that we got to know one another. What a special young man. And I know he's right now looking down at me with that crooked smile of his and that, that, that little laugh when, when he talks to me about, about you um, and inspired me to go forward. I ask that you look upon these students here today and their, and their very dedicated small group leaders as they unpack this question about what our purpose is and that you be with them. They keep them safe in their life and that you just are with them always. And I ask for this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.